Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Good day. My name is Veronica Bjorkman and I'm the Director of Family Outreach and Support. We are so happy and excited that you are able to join us for our third webinar of the 2023 Summer Webinar Series. We are thrilled to collaborate and co-host this year's Summer Series with our colleagues in the Office of Undergraduate Student Life. In July and August, on Fridays at 10 a.m. Eastern, our offices will host a webinar leading up to our new student orientation program, NSOP, and family orientation. A few housekeeping items before we begin. The information discussed today and throughout our webinars is specific to undergraduate students in Columbia College and Columbia Engineering and their families. Our panelists will present for 30 to 40 minutes, and we will leave time at the end for questions. In the Zoom webinar platform, you may ask a question via the Q&A submission box. Given the large number of participants in today's webinar, unfortunately, we will not be able to answer every question, but if you still have a question, we want you to reach out. We are also recording this webinar for families who could not make it today, and it will be available in a few days on our YouTube channel at Family at Columbia. Let's get started. Joining us today from the Office of Undergraduate Student Life is the Assistant Director of Student Engagement, Nina Lamb. Nina, hi, good morning. Hi, Veronica, thanks for having me. Thanks everyone for joining. Yeah, I would also like to welcome our Administrative Coordinator for the Office of Student and Family Support, Joanne Neal. Hi, Joanne. Hi, everyone, good morning. And our Associate Dean of Student and Family Support, Matthew Potashnik. Hi, Matthew. Good morning, Veronica, good morning, everyone. All right, and now I would like to welcome our special guest panelists. Joining us today is Dr. Michael McNeil, Associate Vice President and Chief of Staff of Columbia Health. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Veronica, and good morning to those joining us either live or via the recording. Wonderful. Well, now I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. McNeil. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and I'm very excited to be here and, and to welcome um, all of those that, that are uh, engaging with this conversation today, it, it's always a very exciting time when we get to, to chat with students and families and, and kind of extend our Columbia Health welcome um, for folks. Um, I'll tell you more about our organization, and, and we're really thinking about sharing information today around the idea of partnership, working together to support students in the achievement of their personal and academic goals. So I'm starting off with a photo that represents our organization. We've actually grown significantly since this photo was taken. Um, we're now just a little over 200 college health professionals that are all here to support student success. To think about why we do this work, though, we, we want to start um, with the purpose of having health and, and well-being support on a campus. And, and for us, this uh, Herophilus quote sort of sums up um, the high level of why we do the work we do. And that's simply one cannot find success if one does not uh, have at least manageable good health, right? Good health is defined at the individual level. Um, but but for each of us, if we are not health, uh, experiencing a, a sense of health and well-being, it limits the potential that we might uh, uh, experience. And so we we really see health as an underpinning to the success that we want our students and uh, well, I, I like to think of them as future alumni uh, to experience during their time at Columbia. So with that, we you know we have as you would expect a mission and a vision. And it really is around the, the well-being of our of the individuals and the community, the, the personal and academic development of our students. And we want to cultivate those best possible um, and most enduring outcomes when, when students are with us living, learning, working, et cetera. Right? We really want to embody this idea that health is a, is a foundational element to one's success in higher education. So as an organization, um, we, we are, as I mentioned, quite large, um, and we are organized into six areas that are very student-facing, um, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of these as we go. Um, information around any piece of this process could be quite overwhelming. There's a lot we could say, and each panelist can say on each of these webinars. So I, I'm not going to try to be too granular with information today, but I'm going to try and invite you to follow up around the pieces that feel most germane, either as a student or as a family member or friend. Um, and Joanne has graciously agreed to, to share some of those links and pieces I'll be referencing uh, during the morning. 
the what I will say to students during an orientation process during that NSOP experience is the thing I want you to most remember about Columbia Health is that we exist, right? Um, the, there's so much information. We have more than 70 different program services and resources um, that we sometimes describe as we offer things you didn't even know you needed yet. Um, and that's okay, right? You don't need to know everything in our service index, but you need to remember that we're there and that's a place you might look for information or a place you might reach out. Um, we also recognize that our students aren't always physically on the Morningside campus, right? They may be somewhere else in New York. They may be home visiting. They may be doing a study abroad or, or experiencing life during a personal travel. Um, Columbia Health is still here and still available, right? We offer in-person and virtual support across our entire organization. Um, I always point to that moment of pride for us in 2020 when much of the world was trying to figure out how to go remote. Um, we flipped on telehealth for 56 providers in a weekend because we'd actually already built the platform and we were going to pilot it in summer of 2020. And instead, we, we went all in in spring of 2020, right? We knew telehealth and, and that virtual secure support was a part of the future. Uh, COVID just made us do it faster. Right, so it, it, it's part of how we think about where are our students and how do we meet them in those spaces to provide that support. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the organization um, in, in just a minute, uh, but but first I want to transition and talk about parents and families, right, as as partners in this process, right. Um, I always think of families um, it, broadly defined, right? Um, families of origin, families of choice, et, et cetera. They're our first teachers, right? They are the people that help us learn to navigate the world even after we begin an academic schooling process, right? We still learn from our friends and our family and, and, and our relatives and what our communities. So we encourage um, folks to build on that idea, right? Um, and, and one of the things you'll hear me say as, as we talk about the, the students in the Columbia ecosystem is to, to teach them rather than to do for them. And you'll see that very explicitly on a forthcoming slide, right? This is about a learning process, right? When you, when you enroll in higher education, it is about learning and it doesn't always mean just learning in the classroom, right? So we want to invite people to recognize that we have these technical adults, but they're still learning to adult. Um, many of us are still learning to adult, right? It's more of a lifelong process. Um, so we we invite families to be uh, to be in that teacher role, right? To encourage exploration, uh, de developing senses of independence and responsibility. And and you'll notice a number of my slides will have some citations in them where I've drawn from the uh, academic research literature around how families and, and and parents can work together to support health and well-being in students. And one of those is managing expectations. Right? Uh, there are times when students engage with our team and they're just not feeling their best, right? That's often what makes them think about, I woke up this morning, I'm not feeling well. Um, if we, if For those of you that are familiar with the US healthcare system, you know that there's a process of getting an appointment and seeing a provider and, and helping people know and manage those expectations will, will actually help them experience less stress or anxiety around accessing care, right? So that's just an example. Uh, our families are great influencers of the choices that we make and the behaviors that we exhibit. What we specifically invite is for families to reinforce the healthier choices as the default choice or the norm. Right? We want to think about, and, and part of the work in Columbia Health is making those healthier choices the easier choices when, when one is engaging with the campus. Right? We want to encourage things like good time management, developing a sense of resiliency and, and, and coping mechanisms, which of course are quite unique to each individual. Um, we, we want to share, there's some actually very interesting literature that talks about if families are communicating with their student when they're in school, when you do so, can have very specific mitigators on potentially risky behaviors. And I'll give you one of the examples that's better studied, and that's around uh, undergraduate students that make the choice to consume alcohol. And we know not all of them do, right? But among those that do, if families communicate on a fairly regular basis, and one of the studies specifically talks about on Fridays, it actually moderates alcohol consumption among those students across the entirety of a weekend process, 
students are, are less likely to, for example, overconsume on a Thursday because they know they're going to talk to their family on Friday. They're less likely to overconsume on a Friday or Saturday, having recently communicated with their family. Um, and, and so it, it's just an, one example, um, but timing and, and thinking about how you position communication can actually help encourage those healthier choices across our community. Um, and families, of course, have, have direct and indirect influence on, on the friends, right? Encouraging students to spend more time with friends um, and, and colleagues who support them and their goals is going to actually engender better well-being for the student and the community. So let me give you a couple of others here, um, and then we'll, we'll talk about the, the student-specific piece of this. Right? We want to encourage you to promote accountability. Um, and, and you'll see this is where I include that bullet of guide and support rather than do. Um, we know that families want to help in the process for, for students, and, and that, and absolutely, right? Um, but it, it, we, we invite you to help teach them how to do it rather than just do it for them, right? So it's, in, it, it's perhaps offering a reminder of a deadline rather than asking the student for their university credentials to log in and do it for them. Um, it's about reminding them to, to check their emails. The university communicates official messages to our student population, many of them by email. Um, and, and those emails will contain deadlines. And, and, and in the example of my group, we're gonna have folks who are gonna be emailing on a recurring scheduled basis if an action hasn't occurred, right? So if a student continues to receive these emails, it means there's an action step they have yet to complete. So encouraging them to pay attention to those messages. Um, we invite you to, to learn a little bit more about our resources so that you can refer students and connect them, right, when they're here. Um, there are areas, and then I have these two, two sets of help and hinder pieces that I've, I've pulled out of the academic literature um, and areas where uh, parents and families can be incredible helps, but at, at times also perhaps introduce barriers, right? So making the decision to attend Columbia, right, could be a help, very helpful piece. Um, it is, we all know that families often provide financial support, although that isn't true for every student. Um, some families will have members who have previously attended college and can offer insights on that process. Some, like me, come from families where I was the first to go through that experience. And therefore I had to, I learned to navigate that a little bit more on my own, although certainly my family did try to provide support. Areas where um, families can, out of the best of intentions, sometimes actually introduce some challenges in the process, um, is pushing students towards certain courses. Right, as opposed to the previous slide that talked about explore, exploration. Um, and the other one I just want to mention here is the idea of glorifying busy, right? Um, and just full transparency, I actually talk about this in a book chapter on time management for college students, that we really need to end the glorification of busy. Everyone is busy just in different ways, right? So rather than in, kind of glorifying and encouraging, you always need to be doing something, uh, as an example that comes from from my writing, um, worrying is, is time well spent, right? If you plan time to think about, for example, an assignment or worry about the topic you're gonna choose for a term paper, you, you are less likely to feel behind when you start working on it because you allocated time to thinking about it first, right? Um, rather than just getting busy on your assignment, right? So it's just a very sim simple example. Okay, so let's talk about uh, directly connecting back to the students. Um, we want to encourage students and families to challenge misperceptions, to expect responsibility and accountability from each other, to, to be a bi-directional guiding and referring piece, right? Sharing those questions, sharing those resources. Um, families, as I said, are teachers, so they, they help really provide life skill training, and this goes the other way. Right. If if uh, if you're a family member and you've ever asked a younger person to help you with an electronic device, that's life skill training, right? Just in a different direction. Um, and I'll admit, my niece helps me with things from time to time. Um, and we want to encourage the idea that that the college experience, while a great learning experience, is is also fun and doesn't have to be consequence filled, right? In fact, for most of them, it's not. 
So that's just some background that I, that I thought would be really helpful. Now, let me get into some of the specifics that I think some of you really want to hear from me today. And that's a little bit more about our organization, right? So I will, I will talk uh, specifically about on, on and off campus care um, and, and some of the resources and some of the action steps. Just quickly to name the parts of our organization and tell you briefly uh, some of the focus areas. I'll start with the one most people think about and, and is a little bit the focus of the next slide, which is our medical service, right? We are a fully accredited medical service. Um, we are in fact certified as a patient-centered medical home or as we call it, student-centered medical home. And we offer routine care and urgent care, right? During the academic year, we, run, we operate extended hours six days a week. Right, so that we're available when students need us. We also offer 24 seven access through medical, right? Uh, we versus via telephonic mechanism. So there's always someone on call in the medical team that can be reached if, if a student has a need. Uh, I'll continue around our, our circle logo here. Uh, Alice Health Promotion is our prevention services unit, but they also offer direct services, right? So while they're out there helping students develop skills to make those healthier choices, to live those healthier behaviors, they also offer one-on-one -on -one support in this area. So one of their um, uh, most in-demand resources is our wellness coaching program, where students who want to work on a particular well-being-centered goal can work one-on-one -on -one with a highly trained individual to develop strategies around that. So let's go back to my earlier example, time management. Um, if a student wants to work on their time management, this is a team that can help them do that. Um, and that's just one example of so many things that are out there from that group. Our student health insurance office. Uh, it's important to note that our team works for the university, not for the insurance company. So they are here to support our students. Um, about two thirds of all students at Columbia across all levels will be enrolled in the university plan. At the undergraduate level, it's about one third of our undergraduates with the rest being primarily on uh, parent or family plans. Columbia's expectation is that you have high quality insurance and we are what's called a hard waiver school. And I'll talk ab uh, about that process in just a moment. Um, but, and the goal is to make sure that you have good coverage to mitigate against any unexpected costs that could interfere with the pursuit of, of one's academic program. Our disability services team provides accommodations, both short-term and ongoing um, to help facilitate student access and success. If, if you as a student or your student um, has ever had an IEP or other type of accommodation, we would encourage you to get connected with that team early, um, even if you're not sure if an accommodation would be necessary, right? What we would prefer is to have you connected to the ecosystem so that should, it be, should an accommodation be needed, that we can kind of get that in place as quickly as we can, right? It, it becomes challenging when folks wait till just before finals to come forward and say, well, my student has historically, or the student says, I've historically had extended time on tests. That may be a quite reasonable accommodation, but it's very difficult to put in place immediately before an exam. All right, so just connect with us early on. I also mentioned temporary. So uh, my favorite example of this is uh, if someone were to for sprain an ankle, there are certain elevators at Columbia that are, are access restricted and our DES team can help facilitate that access to make sure folks can get around safely. Counseling and psychological services provide short-term mental health support, uh, both in a therapeutic model, but also in an educational model. We have, uh, for example, uh, the, the traditional one-on-one -on -one counseling that you might expect us to offer, but we also have things like discussion groups, right, that are not therapy-centered, but they're places for people to come together around a common identity or a common concern and find guided peer-level support. Right. Um, so, and, and in CPS, um, as we abbreviate it, um, it, we focus very heavily on making sure, well, we actually do this in our entire organization, making sure we have a diversity of staff to provide students because we have folks from so many different backgrounds. And, and CPS in particular, we can offer treatment in more than a dozen languages. Um, I believe with our newest hire, we're now up to 19 languages that we can offer. And then the last of the six listed on here is our sexual violence response, which much like Alice, Alice has two branches within it. We do provide direct services to students who are survivors or co-survivors of violence. Um, many of the folks that we support have experienced something in their past and come forward during their time at Columbia. And we're, we're actually um, not only happy to provide support, but, but we're also reassured by the, the fact that they felt safe enough uh, and supported enough to come forward and seek some support. 
we also have a, a prevention services team. We do believe it's a big, big task, but if we don't keep working on it, we will never achieve a, a, a society with little to no interpersonal violence. So we have a prevention services team designed to help uh, build skills and facilitate and, and work towards a violence-free culture. So getting into uh, the medical pieces, because there are often many questions about this, we, we've broken this down for you into an on versus off campus piece, because that, that question comes up regularly. What do you do on site? When might uh, a student need to go off campus? So on campus, and th these are examples, this is not everything, right? It's that routine medical and urgent, it's that short-term mental health care, it's the, the DS programs, it, et cetera. Again, six days a week during the academic year. For most students, appointments are easily made on our website through the patient portal. That would include medical, all medical appointments and uh, initial conversations with, with the counseling team. Um, we do use a, um, an, a version of an open access model that's a 24 hour rotating window for uh, logging in to make an appointment. Most students that want to engage specifically with the medical team want to be seen relatively close in, right? The example from earlier, they woke up, they're not feeling so great. They want to kind of check in with a provider. So we're, we're not releasing that many advanced appointments so that there's space for those folks coming in. It also reduces no-shows. We, we do a lot of work about on reducing people making an appointment and not showing up because if someone doesn't show up, it's effectively blocking that appointment time for another student who might need it, right? So we use this shorter term piece. Every hour, um, appointments open up if it's an operating hour, 24 hours from that point. So at, you know, at 10 a.m. this morning, um, it's a Friday, so it wouldn't open. Uh, but like during the academic year, you might see Saturday options. And we do, uh, Saturdays is actually primarily walk-ins. Um, and it's really for those students who have kind of put it off to the end of the week and now they want to see someone. Uh, so we use more of an urgent care walk-in model on Saturdays. We have a number of specialties on site, but we don't have everything. Um, the good news is Columbia Health is deeply connected to the New York City healthcare ecosystem. So we can provide referrals. And if you're on, if you're student, uh, a student on the insurance plan, you'll need a referral from us for most off-campus care. Um, we have a very carefully crafted referral network. Right? When we make a referral to an individual provider, it's an office that we know. It's a provider that we know. Right? It's not a name from a list. It's a person who is known to our team. And that, that's very important to us. We don't want to just, there's a lot of healthcare opportunities in New York. We want to make sure that we are connecting students with places that we know they will receive the quality of care that, that we know they should have. On the mental health side, um, for those on our insurance plan, we have a custom network of providers that accept insurance only for students on the Columbia plan. There's about 300 of them in New York City. And this is done to help remove some of the cost barriers associated with accessing mental health care since many mental health care providers don't take insurance. We've developed this custom network with, with folks that are, that are well qualified and, and can provide great care to our students. And starting with the fall plan year, the first 10 off-campus visits uh, for mental health care for students on our plan will carry no copay. This is a benefit enhancement we're rolling out to further reduce concerns around cost access to mental health care off campus. Um, we don't have a pharmacy on site, but there are six within very close walking distance of campus, and there are 17 in-network pharmacies um, in the zip code uh, for those on our insurance plan. Um, if it is a true emergency, right, more than urgent care, we will certainly refer folks off, and the closest hospital is directly across the street from the building where our medical services is located. So there is, is quick access in, when you're in Morningside Heights. Some specialists will need to refer off-site. As I said, we have some on-site, some will need to refer. We can handle most dermatology on-site. That's one of the most frequently requested. Um, much of that we can do in-house. And one of the important things to know about accessing in-house care, every student pays a health and related services fee. And as a result, when you come to our medical service, you don't have out-of-pocket expenses in nearly every visit. The, the one exception to that is select travel vaccines. Um, so when someone comes in and sees a provider, they don't have to worry about their insurance card. They don't have to worry about a copay. That they, they just need to worry about getting care, right? And, and our model is set up so that that's exactly what it's about. It's centered on the care. Uh, we don't have radiology on site. So that's another area we would refer out. And I've also talked about long-term mental health care. 
So a couple, th a couple of things I'm going to go through relatively fast. There are a couple of new student actions. I'm going through this fast because I know some of you have already done this, right? And I want to thank you for doing it early. Um, the New York State does require some immunizations, and, uh, and so obviously does Columbia as a part of that, that policy compliance. So if you haven't already, please submit your MMR and meningitis decisions through our patient portal. Um, the earlier it is submitted, the better, so that when our team reviews, if there is anything of concern that requires clarification, there's plenty of time to take care of it. Um, and please note, all students are on an immunization hold, a health hold, for registration until they achieve compliance. There is no opportunity to bypass the hold and register. You can only do so if you are fully compliant. Um, please remember to submit your health history form. This is especially true for students who will be transitioning care to our team. So if uh, you're a student who receives allergy shots and want our team to take over that process, make sure you let us know about that on the health history form so that our care team can reach out and, and, and connect with your allergist and get all of that sorted before you arrive uh, for the fall term. Make sure your mailing address is up to date. That's especially important if you're on the insurance plan because that's where any print communications around insurance will be will be sent. Um, and then I mentioned earlier that you know we have that insurance requirement. Um, all students uh, will automatically be placed on the plan um, as, as a full-time student or an international student. Um, and then you have a choice. You can either confirm that you wish to remain on that plan or you can request a waiver of the plan if you have comparable coverage that meets the university's requirements. So um, the, the waiver request is open until September 30th. We have a very long open enrollment period. It is live now um, and thousands of students have already submitted and we're very grateful for that. Um, and it is an annual process, right? Same thing with immunization, submitting early. That way, if there are any questions or any uh, uh, additional information that is necessary, um, we would have plenty of time to take care of that. Students will, uh, once they are registered or in, in the registration process, will begin receiving messages from us about taking this action. And they will continue receiving these messages until they complete the action. Or if they ignore them all, they will be default added to the plan and at that point are responsible for the costs associated. Okay, um, I mentioned this, so I'm really not going to go into the details here. Um, I do just want to, we sometimes get questions about flu shots. So this is a moment to say, in addition to this pre-matriculation things, we do a lot of work around community health and well-being. Flu vaccines is one of them. Uh, students are offered no cost vaccines um, in October, and we do large scale events where they can just literally walk in, uh, get their flu shot and be on their way. The average time spent in that location for a flu shot is about five minutes most days. Um, and then um, I'm, I'm including this slide so you have it as a reference point to come back to. I'm not going to go through the details. It's just students are submitting via their patient portal. Um, the one piece I want to uh, just to call out is if you if your records are not in English, and I was not born in the U.S., so some of my records are not in English, um, you would need to include a certified translation for any non-English language records. And we do strongly encourage the use of the Columbia form. It's the quickest and easiest way to achieve compliance when signed by a licensed health care provider. On the insurance piece, I mentioned already the, the deadline. I just want to reinforce the annual nature of this. So every year a student is enrolled. Um, it's a fall to fall process. So open enrollment begins every July, uh, ends every September, and it's for that fall through the next summer academic year. And again, we will send recurring regular email communications and our system does allow us to verify delivery opens, web clicks, all of that, so we can make sure that students are actually able to, to receive and access the information contained therein. Um, again, I'm including a couple of slides here that just for, for uh, reference purposes. Okay, so it's, we're at 1030. I, I wanted to get quick, good information out there as a foundation that would then allow us to kind of answer some very specific questions, and I know there are some. Um, and then, the, of course, the links that have been shared and the next slide will include our URL and our uh, general email address. But I, I want to just before we start answering questions, uh, share another quotation with you. Um, this one from Ann Landers, uh, which is kind of what I started with, right? It's not what we do for our children, but what we teach them to do for themselves. So that's where I want to kind of end where I started, which is inviting students and families to work together in a learning process not just about health, but really about life. Thank you so much, Dr. McNeil. We really appreciate you taking the time today.
it does look like we do have some questions coming in. So I'm going to ask you some of those questions. Um, let's see, the first question. We know that there's a lot of moving parts when it comes to uploading things for Columbia Health. So sometimes you might be compliant or non-compliant. Um, let's say, for example, you've uploaded an immunization record and it says compliant. Would those folks need to go back and have the pre-registration immunization form uh, signed by a doctor? So great question. If you have already achieved compliance, you have done what you need to do, and we thank you very much for doing it, mm -hmm. right? Um, once you get that green check mark of, of full compliance, um, you're, you're good to go, right? And your records will remain in our system generally for the duration of your academic program and about eight years thereafter. So we even become, for those undergraduates who go on to do a graduate program, whether it's at Columbia or another place, we're actually a source of future records if you would need them for another institution. But once you're compliant, you don't need to do the form, right? We, while we prefer the form, if what you have is a WHO yellow book or a printout from an EMR from another system that, that has the requested or required information, we, as long as our team can verify it, you'll get that green check and you're good to go. Once you achieve full immunization compliance, you should also receive an email. It is an automated process, but it is not a real-time process. So the email could could lag by a couple of business days relative to the day the green the the check mark turns green. Perfect. Okay, so we know that the uploading documents are important. We have some questions coming in about the importance of when to upload a document. Um, it looks like if you've if you've already signed your medical directives, mm -hmm. um, is this something that you should upload to the Columbia portal now or just when it's needed for medical issues? So we, we generally say share that information because think of that as part of a health history, right? It's a, it's a health history decision, right? Not necessarily an experience of a condition, but, it, but it's a background on one's health. Having that before it's needed actually makes the process easier when it's needed, right? Rather than saying, we need this from you, it might, you might not be feeling terribly well or remember where it is or what have you. So go ahead and submit it when, when, when you're in the system and then it will be there. And again, you can see everything you upload to us. So should you ever realize like, oh, I don't remember what I did with that, you know you will have access to printing a copy from, from the Columbia Health Patient Portal. So early is, is always better with uploads. Perfect. Okay, so when students are accessing healthcare, we know there's a wide variety of, of folks, um, nurse practitioners, nurses, doc physicians, doctors, what um what what levels uh will the students be accessing will they see physicians or will they see mid-level professionals so it's it's going to vary based on the need of the student and what they have requested right our system will auto assign a primary care provider either a nurse practitioner or a physician to every student when their record is created it's an automated system so that there is a name of record to connect with the student and that will also put them in one of our four care teams, right? As a patient-centered medical home, we have care teams. So when a student is assigned to a provider, they are also connected with that provider's group. And when they go to make an appointment, first choice will be to display availability of their provider. The second will be someone else within the care team, right? That being said, if you have a preference, some people prefer to see an NP, some people prefer to see an MD. A student can change their preferred provider at any time in the patient portal. We can also change it for you, but we want you to have, as students, to have direct access for that. And all of our providers have bios on our website. So if you want to read the bios and see if there's a provider where you think you might connect better with them, if they're not already provi your provider, you can make that selection in our system. Or again, we're happy to help you do that. Um, we will, of course, as care is needed. So let's say someone walks in and we do an initial triage with a nurse. If they are clinically indicated to see a higher level provider, we will facilitate that, right? We always wanna match the care needed to the provider level. And as you noted, we have providers at multiple levels. If somebody is coming in for just a routine vaccine, that can often be handled in a, in a nursing visit. Nursing visits are a little bit shorter and therefore more prevalent. Um, if they also wanna have a conversation with their provider, we can set that up, it's not a problem. Okay. Um we all know that students have um, unique opportunities here at Columbia. Sometimes they might do a study abroad program. 
what, how would you advise when it comes to health insurance for a study abroad program or an overseas program? Um, is the Columbia Health Insurance, um, if they have that, will it cover them? So the short answer is yes, right? Mm -hmm. Columbia Student Health Insurance Plan offers both national and global coverage, and that is by design. Our students are highly mobile. They come from so many parts of the world. We want to make sure that students are covered in, including on personal travel, right? If they take, if they're able to go on spring break to explore a new part of the world, we want to make sure their insurance, they're on our plan, is following them to those spaces. Um, students are still required to have insurance when they are in the study abroad program, right? It, it's not like you can waive just because you're not here, right? Because you're still doing academic engagement through the Columbia world. Um, some students will will want want to be on our plan, for example, during a study abroad, either semester or year because our, of the global nature of our plan. Um, and our team, is a, our student health insurance team in particular, because they work for the university, they know how the student world goes, they're available to offer a consult, right? If a student uh, wants to have a conversation about, I'm considering a study abroad, here's my, you know, I'm currently on my parents' plan, can, can we talk about the pros and cons of this? Absolutely, we're happy to do that. We have a compare your coverage tool on our website. We have a number of other resources so that students can make an informed decision, right? It goes back to what I shared earlier. It's not that we want you on our plan, it's that we want to know that you have great coverage wherever you may be. Okay, so that's just, that's another question that's coming in too, just mm -hmm. as a follow-up. So just to recap, if, if they're on spring break, if they're traveling at the holidays, mm -hmm. if they happen to go to an out of network, um, mm -hmm. it's still, you can still use it. There are there are out of network is more expensive in the U, U and that's a U.S. healthcare system thing. That's sure. not a Columbia thing. Sure, but there is still coverage. Right? Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, um, I think let me look and see if we might have time for one more question. Okay, um, it looks like some of the folks have it ha, have been saying that their MMR they've only taken one shot. Mm -hmm. And they had, I know that the other shot is there, it's due by August 1st. What would you suggest in that circumstance? So this is going to be a very case by case answer. So I'll, I'll try to give you the general guiding principles here. Um, with the two dose MMR piece, if you're in the US, it will always be an MMR, right? Because the individual vaccines are gen uh, for measles, most rubella are generally not available in the US. Your second dose has to be at least 28 days after your first dose. Right? So if you only have record of one dose and that, that dose was more than 28 days ago, it's a great moment to roll up your sleeve, get that second dose, upload proof of that and be done. Right? If you are outside the United States, you're in a healthcare system where these vaccines are administered individually. If you have two doses of measles, one of mumps, one of rubella in your records, that will achieve compli compliance. Right? So that's why we say upload what you have our team is looking for the yes, like looking for yes, there is proof of the requirements being met. And if you don't for, but for chance have that, they'll send an individualized message that indicates what's missing. If you are in that 28 day window period, as a courtesy, we will do a temporary release of hold because you are showing efforts to comply. If that second dose is not uploaded shortly thereafter, and shortly, by the way, in this particular moment is defined as two days, so 30 days is the temporary release of hold. The hold will automatically go back on. And should a student fail to complete the, that one, even though they had already registered, they are subject to deregistration from all courses. That is something we, of course, never want to do. So we will repeatedly message and try and help people be compliant because we really want them focused on the reasons they're at Columbia. We know getting an MMR is not why you, you, you certainly can come to us for that, but it's not why you enroll at Columbia University. So if you're in that waiting period, just make sure to get that second dose and upload proof of it. And, and again, watch your email, encourage your student to watch their email, because if, if, they, if they miss it, if they forget about it, whether it's forgetting to get it or forgetting to upload it, we're going to be communicating because we don't, we don't want anybody to, to run up against that deregistration possibility. Sure. It does look like we have time for just one more question, Dr. McNeil. So we have a lot of folks asking if they could be on both Columbia Insurance and their parents' plan, and would that be helpful? So it's always a possibility, right? Um, there, there isn't anything really broadly legally that would prevent that. 
Mm -hmm. If you are considering, for example, a student remaining on a parent plan and also being on the Columbia plan, there's a couple of things that one thing you need to know, which is the Columbia plan will be primary, right? The Columbia plan is always primary insurance. Um, so you, you, that leads to the second piece, which is you may want to have uh, some communications with your current insurance provider to determine how their secondary coverage process works or situations where their secondary coverage process would or would not apply. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also making sure that your current coverage isn't one that would, as a plan, prohibit dual coverage, right? Again, legally, you're allowed to have two, but there are certain types of insurance plans that don't allow double coverage. Um, Columbia plan does, but others may not. So you, you'll want to kind of gather some more of that information before perhaps making that decision. Um, it is actually not unusual for students to come off of a family plan and come onto the Columbia plan for the time they're, they're part of the world because it is such a global, wide-reaching, national network, you know, all of that kind of plan. And in some cases, that results in financial savings for families as well. Um, yeah. it's this is where our team can be available, right? Our insurance team can, can have those conversations, can teach students what questions to ask as they learn about how insurance works. Um, or perhaps learn how the U.S. healthcare system works, right, if they're not familiar. Thank you. It's interesting that you bring the, the cost up. There are folks asking about the cost of a Columbia Health Insurance plan. Yeah. Um, I will be honest, I don't have the numbers committed to memory because it is an annual process and we just went into open enrollment for the new plan year. Okay. Um, please note the Columbia plan, if you're comparing, uh, student health plans in the U.S. are regulated like individual plans, like exchange plans. That's the set of laws that we have to follow. So they will visually appear different in price from a, for example, employer plan. Right. Employer plans are generally subsidized. The employer pays the, the vast majority of it and the employee pays only a small portion of it for, for individual coverage. Family coverage varies um, based on the, the plan offering. If you compare the Columbia plan cost to the same level of benefits in the state of New York, it costs more than four times the amount that the Columbia plan does. Um, we, we, we check this every year um, and we have a very robust plan because we want that, that robust coverage, right? You want students to have a finite amount of potential out-of-pocket exposure and the plan pays the rest. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we are out of time for additional questions. However, if you still have something you would like to ask, you can reach out to us via email at ugrad-family at columbia.edu or ugrad student life at columbia.edu. A big thank you to Dr. Michael McNeil for joining us today and to also for all of you joining us today. If you haven't already, please register and join us for our next webinar, which is next Friday, July 28th at 10 a.m. Eastern to learn more about life as a Columbia student. Take good care, everyone. Bye.